This happened when I was having a quiet night in. It was kind of late, and I was just lounging on the couch. My dog had hopped up onto the couch with me, and was sleeping with his head on my belly. I remember that I was watching some Major League Baseball game marathon, and it felt like it was going on forever. I was really drowsy, and I was nodding off at points. Suddenly the dog jumped off of me, and down to the floor. He stared at the frosted door that leads to the hallway. I asked my dog, What's wrong, boy? But he wouldn't even look my way. He was completely fixated on that door. I sat up, and I looked at his face. He was baring his teeth. I've never seen him do that before. He was always such a placid little guy. My dog was beginning to worry me now. My worries increased when I heard him let out a very low, deep, sustained growl. This was so odd because, like I said, I hadn't ever seen this kind of behavior from my dog before. His fur was up and he had taken this aggressive forward-leaning stance. I decided to turn my attention to the lounge door. I wanted to figure out what my dog was growling at. I couldn't believe what I saw. There was a dark silhouette behind the frosted glass and it was doing this very strange and creepy swaying movement. It was like it was coming closer to the door and then retreating backwards. Like it was trying to decide whether to try to come in or not. It was very creepy. I had a stun gun, so I backed over to my backpack, which I had thankfully left in the lounge that night, and I dug it out. I remember hearing myself say something like, What the hell is this? Out loud. The atmosphere in my house that day seemed so dark and tense. I stood there with my dog thinking, at any moment the door could open, or at any moment that shadowy figure could turn and leave. My legs were shaking. I was finding it hard to keep balance and of course my arms were shaking even more. I just tried my hardest to steady my aim. All the while my dog was still growling at the shadow of some unknown intruder. Then suddenly, just as quick as it began, it was over. The shadow just dissipated. It was like it had disappeared in a puff of smoke. Was it ever really there? I'm pretty sure something was there. The way it disappeared was so strange. It kind of just gradually seeped back into the darkness. I must sound so crazy, but it's true, I swear. That's what I saw. After it left, my dog calmed down. And he just went right on back to the couch and laid down as if to say, nothing to worry about now. It was amazing. I'll tell you now, it took a hell of a long time to summon the courage to open that door. But when I did, I found no signs of a break-in and my door was firmly locked. I even had put the chain on no one had been in my house, but I definitely saw something, and I know that my dog saw it too. I think I was visited by some kind of spirit, and based on how my dog and I felt when we encountered it, I don't think that it was a particularly friendly spirit. I'm just grateful that my dog picked up on it and was there with me. It was honestly a terrifying experience. I'm from the countryside. In fact, my family home lies just behind the shadow of a tall mountain. The land that the mountain stands on is actually owned by my grandfather. Our family have always been happy to allow villagers to use the land, as long as a small portion of their profits are shared with us. By that, I mean the grounds are free to walk, the fields are free to work, and the game is free to hunt. To me, that doesn't seem like that much of a bad deal. Due to my family's history of being somewhat more than kind with this arrangement, we have been beset by thieves over the years. 
since our family wanted to make sure we continued this community spirit, the elder men in my family offered to patrol the mountain ranges at night in search of thieves. My family would often remind me of areas on the mountain range that would be dangerous at night. In their words, it was for adults only. The adult world, no children allowed. It didn't stop me and my friends exploring though. We found out pretty quickly why the adults didn't want us to play in those areas. For one, the wildlife, but more realistically, there was a pretty deep cave and to us kids, that cave was one of our favorite playgrounds. It felt like it was ours. So that leads me to this experience I had when I was a kid, which I'm certain that will live with me for the rest of my days. I was playing in the forbidden areas of the mountain range, like normal, in the cave. All of a sudden, I had the urge to pee, so I decided to head out and do it behind a tree. We were usually nervous about being in places where we were explicitly told not to play in, but being caught peeing out there, well that really gave me the willies, if you'll uh, pardon the expression. I was basically double scared of being caught. I kept looking around to make sure that the coast was clear, but then, as I was midstream, I saw someone. There was a stranger walking up towards the cave. He was down by the river. I shot back behind the tree. I didn't even have a chance to pull my pants up. He was a middle-aged guy by the look of it. And I didn't know that man. I hadn't ever seen him before. I knew everyone who was permitted to use the mountain range. It wasn't a big village. My family had been talking about someone who had been stealing mushrooms. And that may sound trivial, but some of these mushrooms that we grew, they could fetch a pretty price. It made sense that this stranger could be the thief everyone was talking about. He was carrying a backpack, and he was clearly on the lookout for something. If this was the thief that my family was so worried about, then I didn't want to be seen by him. I stayed as still as possible, out of sight, in the trees and bushes. I felt like such an idiot. This was exactly what my parents had warned me about. I watched the stranger. It looked like he was looking for something, and he was being cautious. I kept an eye on him to make sure he didn't spot me, or tried to come close. I mean, I had no plan if he did come close. I was just too scared to take my eyes off of him. I watched him for a while, and then I noticed someone approaching from behind him. I knew who was approaching very well. He was my uncle. He approached the stranger. My uncle was holding a shovel. He stopped the guy, and it looked like those two were in conversation. I was too far away to make out anything that they were saying though. My uncle seemed to be admonishing the guy, giving him a real telling off, you know? The stranger, or should I say, Feath, took off his backpack at what looked to be the order of my uncle. My uncle then snatched the thief's backpack. He opened it, and then I saw my uncle get very angry. Then something happened that I didn't think would ever be a possibility. My uncle smacked the thief across the back of the head with the shovel. The thief went limp and just fell flat on his face in the dirt. My uncle then dragged the stranger into the river and watched as his lifeless body bobbed downstream. My uncle then walked off in the opposite direction like nothing happened. That scared the hell out of me. My uncle was the younger of the two brothers, the elder being my dad. And man, my uncle had my sides aching so many times when I was a kid. He was hilarious. But in that moment, he didn't look anything like himself. He looked so cold and expressionless. It gets worse because he came round to our house for dinner that night. And I had to sit opposite him, knowing what I knew. He was smiling and joking as usual. It was as if nothing had happened. At one point, he looked at me right in the eyes 
and I thought to myself for a brief second while he and my father spoke about trespasses on the mountain range. Do you know? The thief didn't ever come back. I'm not sure what happened to him, but I can guess based on what I saw. If he did manage to get away, he never went to the police or anything. I learned about the adult world that they had warned me about with their off-limit areas that day. It was a really scary experience, and I haven't been able to look at my uncle the same way since. Up until now, I've only told my close friends and family about what happened, but I think it's time to share it here. I'm a police officer, and since I'm still employed as one, I'm going to keep the personal details of my experience anonymous. It happened when I was younger. I was relatively new to the force. I was three years into the job, and I was still earning my stripes. I wasn't as experienced as I am now. Due to that inexperience, I wasn't given anything too taxing, a few patrols, and a lot of desk work. A few officers were out that day. We were patrolling by car since it was winter. It was a very cold winter that year. The snow had been falling for days, and it lay thick on the sidewalks and the streets. But it seemed like the snow was going to stop. I was patrolling just outside the city limits. I was going up a mountainous road. There was a parking lot up there, and truckers used it occasionally to take a rest or use the bathroom. However, during the winter, there is no real reason why anyone should go up there, because they closed the through road. Occasionally, people went up there when the roads were closed to take drugs or do other things. I always checked it out, even during winter. So I went up there on that snowy day, and I pulled into the parking lot. There was one vehicle parked there. It was a minivan. The van had about 20 centimeters of snow on its roof and its windshield. There were no tire marks in the snow. I thought that the van might have been abandoned, or in the worst case scenario, there might be someone in there. I radioed to a colleague and asked him to check the license plate. They came back belonging to an individual who had been reported as missing, and possibly suicidal. I approached the driver's side door, and I could only see one outcome. I tried the door, but it was locked. Then I went about removing the snow from the windshield so that I could take a look inside. It took a while because I didn't have any tools and it was very thick. Once the windshield was clear, I looked in and found the outcome I knew I would. There was a body. He was lying down on the back seats. He didn't respond when I called out to him. I saw that there were charcoal briquettes placed by his feet. Burning charcoal in an enclosed environment like that would be fatal. I'll be honest, I stood there thinking. It was already too late, but I called an ambulance, as I thought that would be the right thing to do. I wanted to do my best and help. I was overcome with panic and concern for the man. After a few moments, I heard the ambulance approaching down there in the town. I smashed the window. I needed access to the van because I could at least try to resuscitate the guy before the paramedics got there. I picked a window closer to him, one of the backseat windows. I reached through and I grabbed him by the leg and shook it. His leg felt cold, but the weather was cold too. My heart was still racing at this point. I shook his leg again and to my amazement, he opened his eyes. I was so taken aback, I literally froze. It was like my heart skipped a beat. The ambulance sirens were getting closer and closer. That sound helped me hold it together. Somehow, I managed to calm down a little. The man's eyes were shut again, and I'll be honest, I had no idea if that man was alive or dead. An odd thought popped into my mind. I imagined him walking between life and death. I saw him open my eyes, I know I did. Yet, now it looked like his eyes hadn't been opened for days. All the snow on the car and the charcoal told me that I couldn't believe what I saw, but I couldn't agree. 
I was very confused. The body was cold, but I figured the best thing I could have done would have been to attempt resuscitation. Then, the paramedics and another patrol car arrived at the scene, almost exactly at the same time. I told them what had happened. The paramedics went to work, and I took a step back from the situation. A few moments went by, and a detective who had arrived in the squad car came over to me. I liked him. I still do. He kind of took me under his wing when I first started. We chatted for a couple of moments, but then he asked me something very directly. Why did you attempt resuscitation? The body has rigor mortis. He's been dead for at least a day, at the minimum. I gotta tell you, you can't do stuff like that. In order for detectives to clarify the cause of death, we need the body to remain in the state it was found in. Come on, you know this, right? I'm sorry, but you should have known that that guy had been dead for a while. What happened? I felt like my head was spinning. I couldn't tell him that I had just seen the guy's eyes open. I thought if I said that I would be laughed at. I thought I would have that over my head for the whole duration of my career. I could almost hear the constant jokes at my expense. I kept quiet about the dead man opening his eyes, but I know I saw it. I still see it every time I think of that day. I'll never forget that winter's day out in the snow. It still horrifies me. That memory has an amazing power to creep up on me when I'm at my most content. The eyes open when I shut mine. It was the strangest experience. This happened when I was 18. I had finally saved up enough money to buy my own motorbike. It had been something I always wanted. I worked part time and I saved at every chance I had. I did any kind of odd job to earn money. I asked my parents for money. I was obsessed with getting that bike and I was so happy that I had achieved my goal. I passed my test, got my license and got myself a bike. I got it around the start of summer vacation and I was going for a ride almost every day. During the end of summer break, I went and stayed with a friend who was also a biker. We decided we would ride to a local lake and go around it a few times. I went to a store to buy some snacks and some drinks and then I hit the road. I headed towards his place. Around the lake there were many twists and turns and he thought it would be a great place for me to practice taking corners and swerving. I was appreciative of his help but I got tired of it pretty quickly. It was kind of exhausting. Plus, he was way better than me since he had been riding longer. We took a break and I broke out my snacks and drinks and we had a chat. We were relaxing, listening to the chirp of the crickets. Something then broke that silence. It was the shrill shriek of a woman. We were in a remote location in the middle of the night. There shouldn't be anyone here but us. The more I thought about it, the more I thought it sounded like laughter. Who's out there in the dark? I'll tell him to shut the fuck up, right buddy? My friend said in a very loud voice. I guess it was intended as a joke, but it sounded very aggressive. Then, almost in response, came the same horrible shriek. But this time, it was not followed by any laughter. Just one long note. Hey, hey, what's up with her, man? Maybe she's a crackhead or she's hammered. Which one do you think, bro? There was no response from me or the owner of that disturbing voice. I started to get worried. I hope there wasn't someone out there. There's no one out here, man. Nothing out here but that abandoned bus. He said that the bus had been there for a long time. Well, maybe there's a woman on that bus. I mean, you gotta admit that screaming sound was pretty freaky, I said. Oh yeah? Well, let me take a quick look. I haven't even been on that bus yet. And with that, he wandered off. I chuckled to myself and kept snacking. A few moments passed, and then my friend came running back. What happened, man? Ah, oh, you've got to come see this. I am not taking no for an answer. We went towards the rusted old bus, and he whispered to me. Don't freak out, okay? I could only just make out what was inside the bus. It was only lit by the distant streetlights. I didn't like it. My skin broke out in goosebumps. 
There were loads of papers with religious chants scrawled all over them. Garbage and knickknacks were stacked to the roof. There were bouquets of dead flowers and empty milk glass bottles. I have no idea why these things were seemingly being collected and stored in there. As my eyes crossed all the as my eyes crossed over all the other gathered things in there, I swear I heard the soft chuckle of that woman's voice. My friend must have heard it too because he dropped his being the tough guy act. We quickly went back and made our way off the bus. The moment I set foot outside, I heard this thumping sound. We looked in the direction of that sound. There was a woman stood there, with blood running down her face, smashing her head into one of the windows on the bus. Her long, messy black hair was matted with her own blood. She stopped and walked towards us, smiling, and then got on the bus and walked towards the back. She stared at us through the windows all the while she made her way back there. Whoa! My friend exclaimed. He then ran, and I followed, and we got on our bikes and we got the hell out of there. And we haven't been back since. Had we been a little older or a little more mature, we might have not seen that woman as some sort of figure from a horror film, but a woman who perhaps needed some help. This didn't happen to me, but to a friend, and it's up to you if you believe this or not. I'm unsure either, but all I know is that this story really creeped me out. I could kind of empathize with him, because after what he said happened, happened, that I don't know what I would have done. Anyways, it happened when my friend was walking home one night. He was looking at the ground. He's always like that. I tell him to sort his posture out, but he never listens to me. He wasn't expecting to see many people on the streets, if anyone at all, because he worked the night shift. So that was maybe why he walked like that. He said he stopped in his tracks because he saw someone approaching out of the corner of his eye. There was a person walking towards him. He took a glance and said that his first impression was, Oh, the fair must be in town. Because it looked to him like the person approaching was wearing a mask and it had kind of slipped down. It's pretty weird, but hey, they say the weirdos come out at night, right? He said that he stepped to the side to share the sidewalk with this guy. He kept his eye on him, though. He quit looking at the ground. He said that when he got closer, he realized that it wasn't a mask. Well, not a mask made of plastic. He said that it looked like it was all human flesh. He said that he was freaking out at that point. It was literally about 2am and there was someone who didn't look real about to pass him by. He decided not to pass judgement. Maybe it was someone who was suffering some kind of affliction. With that in mind, he cursed himself a little and upped his pace to make sure he would pass by quickly. But then he heard the person speak. Good evening. He looked up to give the person eye contact as not to appear rude and he was shocked by what he saw now that he was closer. He said that now he was certain that it was a mask that the guy was wearing, and the mask was elongated and stretched into a horrible contortion. He said it looked like Munch's painting the scream. God, imagine that on a dark night. My friend said that he couldn't deal with the situation anymore, and he panicked. He turned and ran. He didn't scream or even make a sound. He just turned and ran as fast as he could. His footfall echoing through the empty streets wasn't the only sound that could be heard that night, though, for the man who wished him good evening continued to speak. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. He said it was as if the man was glitching out. He ran as fast as he could, trying his best to ignore it. He didn't stop running until he reached the safety of a nearby convenience store. He was really shaken up. 
He didn't tell me how long he stayed in that store, but I bet it was for a long time. This made me think of something that my grandma used to say. Out here in Japan, if yokai or ghosts call out to you, you should never respond to them. I wonder what might have happened if my friend responded. Whatever it was, seemed desperate to communicate with him. A few days ago I went mountain climbing with a friend from work in the Alps of Japan, Mount Hotakadake. It's a real beautiful part of the world. The route we planned on traversing would take us along the ridgeline of Mount Yarigatake, heading down towards Oku Hotakadake. Along that route there's a V-shaped rocky ridge in the area called the Dai Kireto, or the Big Gap in English, maybe Big Cut. It's like it's been cut into the mountain. This route was littered with thin, rocky ledges. It was one of the most difficult mountain trails to climb. Each year, the death toll rises. The route is treacherous. The sun rose early in the morning, but quickly disappeared beneath a rolling blanket of thick fog. Then, a light drizzle of rain began to fall. It rained three hours before we expected it to that day. We pulled on our raincoats and gear, complaining as we did, and we tied one another's body to the other, using some thick mountaineering rope. We needed to ascend the rocky cliff face, so we used chains and a ladder. It was really tough, about 200 meters. It was a long ascent to the top of that V. Within an hour of the climb, the rain and the wind intensified. The rain was lashing against us, and the wind was making each step more and more difficult. We had the option of turning back. I was considering it, but I felt as if I had enough strength to get up there by the end of the day. We were both determined. The fog was really thick. We paused for a moment to take a break. We stood there looking out into the sea of greyish white fog, and then I heard a voice. It was a man's voice coming from overhead. It wasn't the weather for climbing, as we soon realized. Whoever was out on this range with us must be a pro, and I always relished the opportunity to meet an experienced mountain hiker. The further I climbed, the more I heard the man's voice. We ascended the mountain, and there was some breathtaking views along the hike, through the gaps in the fog. The atmosphere felt otherworldly, ethereal. I thought I might see the owner of that voice along the way since the climbable route was so narrow and the voice sounded so close, yet we didn't run into anyone. I don't know how that was possible since there was no way someone would have passed us by. My friend said to me, Hey, did you hear a guy's voice a while ago? What? You heard it too? Yeah, it sounded like he was falling. Whoa, I heard a man's voice a while ago, but it didn't sound like he was falling. My friend's expression was a mixture of anxiety and doubt. He paused for a moment and then said, We're probably just hearing things. Let's hurry up and get moving. I didn't think we were hearing things, but I didn't want to stick around, so I didn't argue. We were getting to the point where if your foot slipped on the rocks, it almost certainly meant death. We were traversing a narrow ledge, relying on slippery footholds, and then from below, we both heard a raucous wind howl. It sounded like a man's voice, like a horrible scream of fear and pain. That dreadful sound resonated through the mountains. Even though my head told me that it was nothing but the sound of the wind, a part of me believed that it was the screams of a thousand bodiless, otherworldly voices. I was assailed with goosebumps. Concentrate. Be wary of the wind. Keep your body flush to the mountain. No gaps between us and the mountain. Got it? My friend said. His advice was encouraging. I felt reassured. We continued climbing, and after about two hours, we reached a very difficult point in the V-shaped cliff face. We needed to climb vertically. I noticed that there were a few metal pins hammered in, presumably by previous climbers. I knew that this part of our journey would require advanced techniques. My friend went first, and I followed. I placed my feet and hands on the pins he had hammered in, and climbed. It was tough, and we were incredibly high up. We were past the point where looking down provided you with a sense of satisfaction. Should you look down from this height, you would only be provided with the sense of abject horror. The mist below hid 
an unfathomable drop, and perhaps more. When I got to the middle, I heard a man's voice again. It was far more disturbing. I heard a whisper in my ear. <sighs> my blood froze. It felt like someone grabbed my right foot. I felt myself slipping. My friend screamed as he realized. If I hadn't been tied to him, I wouldn't be here today. Thank God he had a good grip and we didn't both plummet. I was in fear. My heart was racing. Adrenaline, it was all happening. I felt as if I couldn't speak. Help me. That bodiless voice uttered close to my ear again. It felt like it echoed in my ears. I was trembling. I will never forget that voice. You can't forget something like that. Even now when I think about it, I get goosebumps. I powered through and finished the climb with my friend. We stayed at a mountain lodge that night, and I met a veteran mountain climber there. I think that he was in his fifties. He said that he had a similar experience to mine. He told me that he had heard a voice while climbing, even though no one was around. He then had a terrible nightmare about a woman falling in the lodge. He said that others in his party had the same nightmare. He said that those that go on long mountaineering trips are the ones who have mysterious experiences in these Alps. The next morning we climbed back down. It was foggy and raining again until we got to the bottom. Thankfully, nothing of note happened that time. We went to a shrine at the base of the mountain range to pray for the souls of those who didn't make it off the mountain range and for the safety of future climbers. When we got home, I got a call from my friend and he just said, Have you seen the news yet? I told him that I hadn't and I asked him what had happened. He said that on the mountain range we had just returned from, news of a tragedy had been reported on TV. Apparently, early in the morning on the northern side of the mountain we climbed with the V-shape, a man had slipped to his death two days before we arrived. The first thought that I had was perhaps he heard the same voice I had or felt the pull on his leg. And then I wondered if it was his voice I heard. Was it him saying, help me? It seems unrealistic. But having experienced something like that, I have no choice but to think it could be possible. This happened when I was in high school. One day my dad told me that he thought our neighbor was missing. All the mail outside his house was piled up. That wasn't like him. He was a very neat and tidy person. My dad knocked his door a bunch of times, but he never answered. He was missing. He didn't leave any kind of note at home. And on the last time we all saw him, we all said that he wasn't acting strangely or anything like that. It seemed totally out of the blue. Three days later, a missing person report was filed. His extended family asked locals to help join the search for our missing neighbor. I joined the search with my grandpa. We both weren't working, so we were free. We met at the assigned meeting place and listened to the instructions of the group leader ahead of starting the search. I was nervous. I was very aware that I was in an adult world. My grandpa did say that they needed me to join the search because I was young. I knew this to be true as most of the people in the search group were as old as my grandpa, if not older. We were split into teams my grandpa and I joined the deep woods and mountains search. I was not accustomed to hiking at that age. I mean, I don't even like hiking nowadays, and come to think of it, I think this experience is to blame for that. I just followed along and tried to keep up with my grandpa and the group. Since I was a young high school student, I could rely on my strength and my energy levels. After a while, we split our group into even smaller groups. My grandpa knew the mountains we lived close to really well. He often went out into the mountainous woods searching for wild vegetables to harvest. So my grandpa said that me and him would head into the deepest part of the woods. I followed my grandpa and we climbed up and down and all over the place, but we didn't find anything. I looked at my watch and it was coming up to noon. According to the instructions of the group leader, we were all to meet while having lunch to exchange information and then set off again. I couldn't see my grandpa. He must have gone off ahead, so I turned around and then called out in the general direction I thought he went off in. 
Before I could finish the word Grandpa, my call turned into an involuntary scream. I didn't ever dream that I would be the one to find my missing neighbor. He hung himself. There was a cloud of flies swarming around the body. There was a light breeze that day, so the body swayed from side to side. I heard the creak of the rope against the tree limb. Hearing my scream, Grandpa came rushing over to me, but he was coming from the opposite side. The body was between us. I saw the look of pure horror on his face. He saw the same sight as I had, and he let out a shocked gasp. He just froze. I called out to him, but he was unresponsive. It was as if he was in a trance. His knees were shaking. I always thought that that was a cliche, but I guess that it was true. I ran over to him. I had to go the long way around the body, as I didn't want to get anywhere near that. When I got close to him, I shook his shoulders. I wanted him to come back to his senses. It was so stressful for me. He slipped to one knee. I saw the sweat gathering on his brow, and his face was turning pale. He couldn't handle what he was seeing, and when I understood that, I knew I needed to get him out of there. I lifted him up onto my back, like a kind of piggyback ride, and headed away from the body. Luckily, there was someone from one of the groups not too far away. I explained the situation and left my grandpa in their care. I just wanted to go home. The police came next. As I was the person who discovered the body, I was tasked with the duty of leading them to it. I knew that Grandpa wouldn't be able to do it, and as much as I didn't want to go back, I knew I had to. I was asked by the police. It's not something I could have gotten out of, I guess. You can't really turn down the police. I climbed the mountain with the police officers, and I hated every second of it. I showed them the tree and they made me stay as they cut down the body. It made such a hollow sound as it hit the ground. Then they took me back to the police station to be interviewed. I had to go through it again and again to their satisfaction. When I was released, my family wanted to know all about it, but I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't keep going over the same thing I saw. I didn't sleep that night. I had pain in my legs, but that wasn't the cause for my lack of sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw the neighbor's body swaying in the breeze. I ended up having insomnia for about a week. <laughs> it didn't end there, though. I wanted to put it all behind me, but I couldn't yet. The owner of the mountain area came to our door with a request. He wanted me to cut down the tree that our neighbor hung himself from, as I was the person who discovered the body. I don't know if this is a thing elsewhere in Japan or even abroad, but I kind of understand it. I mean, it wouldn't be nice for the bereaved to do it, or someone who was scared of going to a place where someone chose to end it all. He offered to pay me to do it as well, and since I was a high school student, I didn't have many chances to make money, so I went with him. I guess that he didn't want the tree to still stand on his property. Maybe his reasons for wanting it cut down were superstitious, and maybe that's why he needed me to do it. With each step further into the woods, I felt closer and closer to all those feelings I felt when I discovered the body. Even though I was exhausted from cutting down a tree, I couldn't get to sleep that night. I didn't sleep well for many nights after that. This happened about five years ago, when I was a high school student. It was summer and a friend of mine from an after school club came up to me and said, Hey, I heard from one of the guys about this place that's supposed to be haunted. Everyone's going later. You in? Hell yes, I was in. I loved anything spooky at that age. So that night, at about seven o'clock, we headed to the location. There were nine of us in total. We all went to the same club and often hung out together. We were heading to the middle of nowhere. There was nothing but flat lands and fields as wide as the eye could see. It was going to be developed into a bunch of new houses. I was all like, where the hell are we going, guys? And 
Then someone replied, To the park. I started to doubt the existence of this park in this desolate area. But we found it after a few more fields. It was completely run down and I bet that it was hardly ever used. All you could hear were insects of the night. It was weird to see empty fields and the partially level grounds all around and then a park smack bang in the middle. It was a little spooky. There was no reason why it shouldn't have been leveled for all the planned construction. Once we got there, my friend started to tell us about the alleged haunting. He said that the swing in the park swings by itself even on days where the wind doesn't blow. I expected to see it maybe slightly sway in the wind, but something crazy happened. It was like it was being violently thrown around in anger by some unseen force. It was amazing. I didn't expect to see anything like that. I thought that it just might be a trick or something. I looked at the guys to see if any of them were, you know, pulling some fishing line or something. I looked over and they were as shocked as I was. I carefully looked at their hands and legs to see if they were moving with the same rhythm of the swing, but they weren't. One of my friends said, Whoa, let's take a video, and went to pull his phone out of his pocket. He aimed his phone at the swing, and then something really weird happened. The moment he pointed it at the swing, his phone went flying as if someone had slapped it out of his hand. We stood there completely dumbstruck. Any of my friends were planning this prank, then they might have just smashed his phone. I realized that it wasn't a prank. It was real. Everyone looked completely shocked. My friend stooped to pick up his phone in silence, and then we heard a terrible scream. We just bolted it out of there. The screams only seemed to get louder and louder the further away we got from that park. The voiceless screams followed us for about five minutes, I swear. We burst into a nearby convenience store to take refuge from what just happened. The store was busy and it served as a welcome distraction. We bought some drinks to calm down. The friend who told us the rumor looked the most worried. He said that he wasn't even sure that we had gone to the right park. It was all a confusing mess. During that summer, everyone talked about that park. All the kids wanted to go there, and myself and my friends went back a couple of times, to be honest. Nothing else really happened, and the rumors just kind of died down. One thing you might find interesting is that a couple of years later, after graduating, I ran into one of the friends who was there that day, the guy whose phone got smacked out of his hand. He said that when he was running away, he looked back, and I guess he was the only one to do so because no one else mentioned this. He said he saw a person with long limbs like a stick insect. He said that it was chasing us, and it seemed like it was almost dancing, teetering, turning and twisting, almost falling at times. The image of a person with long, spindly limbs really sends shivers up my spine. I'm really glad I didn't get to see it. This happened about three years ago. I was with my wife and we were coming home from a long road trip. It was late and we were getting hungry, so we decided to pull into a family restaurant to get a bite to eat. My wife really needed to use the bathroom, so instead of reversing into the parking spot, I just pulled in head on. This is something I don't usually do, by the way. We had our meal and we headed back to the car. We got in and I started the ignition. I went to reverse out of the spot and my parking sensors started sounding off. I looked at the LCD screen on my dashboard and I saw a small child stood behind my car. He was squatting down as if he was drawing something on the ground. He seemed to be completely unaware of my car and my intentions to reverse. He didn't even notice it. It was strange. I mean, it was nearly midnight. What the hell was this kid doing playing out here? That late. I didn't want to honk the horn, it seemed a little aggressive. I had no choice but to turn the engine off and step out of my car and ask the kid to move out of the way. I got out and walked to the rear of my car, but I couldn't see the kid anywhere. Damn kid. I figured he might be trying to prank me, waiting for me to get out of the car and then running off or something. 
I called out to my wife and asked her if she could see the boy, but she couldn't see him either. I looked under the car to see if he had been crazy enough to hide under there, but he wasn't there either. I decided to crouch down behind the car next to mine to see if he would pop out of his hiding place, but he didn't. I guess he went off somewhere. I got back in my car and put my car in reverse once again. And once again, my rear sensors started beeping. I looked at the screen and I saw the same kid there behind my car. I was startled, but more annoyed. I called out to the naughty child. I quickly shut off the engine and jumped out of the car. I felt for sure that I would be able to catch him out this time. But once again, there was no one behind my car. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was around this point that I began to doubt that the kid was real. It was after midnight and I couldn't see his parents anywhere. It's a bit odd for a four to five year old kid to be out here alone without either of his parents looking for him. We were in a parking lot on a busy highway. Why was this kid allowed to run around out here? It didn't add up to me. My wife was looking pretty creeped out too, so I had a feeling that she was thinking the same as me. I asked her to help me out though. I asked her to step out of the car and stand there while I tried to reverse out of the spot. You know, to make sure the kid didn't come out of nowhere. I put my car into reverse for the third time, and for the third time my senses started beeping, and I could see that little boy crouching behind my car. I asked my wife to grab the kid. I planned on giving his parents a piece of my mind, and she called back to me, Keep reversing. There's no one here. I didn't know what to do at that point. I didn't want to hit the kid with my car, but I knew the kid wasn't there. I had to go against what my eyes and ears were telling me, and I trusted my wife. I looked away from the LCD monitor and reversed backwards. I was really nervous. I felt for sure that I would feel a bump, and then I would hear my wife scream, but I didn't. I went past the point where I saw the little boy, and I looked at the monitor, and all I could see was the empty road behind me. I was able to turn my car around and face the exit. My wife got in the car, and we began to pull away. I went nice and slow. I was scared of the slim possibility that there was a little boy out here somewhere. I couldn't help how curious I was, though. I had to take a look back, so I decided to look in the rearview mirror. I saw that little boy, again, right there where I parked. He was still there, drawing or writing something on the ground. This time, he slowly looked away from his drawing and towards my car, and I suddenly felt so scared. I really didn't want to meet eyes with him. I took my eyes off of the mirror and pulled out of the parking lot. I don't know what happened that night, but it's something I'll never forget. My wife and I think that something happened to that boy in that car park. Potentially something fatal. Could a car have hit that child and we were seeing an apparition? Well, that's what we think anyway. Unfortunately, I can't remember the exact location of the car park, but I found some news of fatal accidents in that general area. I think about this incident sometimes when I hear of accidents on the road. This is a story I was told by my granddad. He grew up during the war, and back then many of the houses had these dirt floors out in the countryside. It was pretty normal, apparently, in Japan. I will try to provide you with word for word for what my grandfather told me. His father was a taxi driver, and his mother died before he was five years old. His dad needed to work every hour God sent him, just to keep food on the table. It couldn't have been easy back then. Since he was a taxi driver, he worked a lot of antisocial hours. He would stay with his neighbors while his father was working, and then when his father finished work, he would come and get him again. It became more and more frequent, and his father didn't want to be a bother to his neighbors after they had been so helpful, so sometimes, when he knew that he would be home really late, he would leave my father alone in the house. Of course, this situation wasn't ideal, and my grandfather said that he was often very lonely and scared home alone. He said that he would sit on the floor and cry and call for his father often. The neighbors would hear this, but they couldn't do much as 
they didn't want to intervene. One night, the neighbor heard my grandfather's cries, and then they heard laughter. They thought to themselves, hey, that's great, maybe his dad's come home. But a couple of hours later, they heard my grandfather call out to his father as he came through the door. The neighbor thought it was strange because they were convinced that my granddad was talking with someone next door. Over the course of the days and weeks, the neighbors heard my grandpa laughing and talking with someone next door when they knew that his father was out driving his taxi. The neighbor grew concerned and suspicious, so they went to investigate. My grandpa was apparently sat alone in the kitchen on the dirt floor, in the dark, laughing and speaking with something unseen. They were really worried about him, so they waited with him until his father came home. When his dad came home, he was asked directly who had he been speaking with every night. And my grandfather said in response, I've been speaking to the mother. I was scared and lonely and crying, so the mother came. She hugs me and rubs my cheeks. She cares about me. His father then asked about how this mother was getting in and out, and my granddad pointed at a corner of the kitchen. The dirt was disturbed in this area. There was a gap between the bottom of the wooden wall and the dirt floor. Someone could have crawled in and out through that gap. My granddad then said to his dad, She crawls through every night smiling at me. Well, my granddad's dad was disturbed by that and covered the gap with boards and asked for a reduction of hours at work while he looked for a new place. Sometimes at night, he said he heard scratching against the boards, but could never find anyone out there when he went to look for the source of the sound. This happened when I was having a quiet night in. It was kind of late, and I was just lounging on the couch. My dog had hopped up onto the couch with me, and was sleeping with his head on my belly. I remember that I was watching some Major League Baseball game marathon, and it felt like it was going on forever. I was really drowsy, and I was nodding off at points. Suddenly the dog jumped off of me, and down to the floor. He stared at the frosted door that leads to the hallway. I asked my dog, What's wrong, boy? But he wouldn't even look my way. He was completely fixated on that door. I sat up, and I looked at his face. He was baring his teeth. I've never seen him do that before. He was always such a placid little guy. My dog was beginning to worry me now. My worries increased when I heard him let out a very low, deep, sustained growl. This was so odd because, like I said, I hadn't ever seen this kind of behavior from my dog before. His fur was up and he had taken this aggressive forward-leaning stance. I decided to turn my attention to the lounge door. I wanted to figure out what my dog was growling at. I couldn't believe what I saw. There was a dark silhouette behind the frosted glass and it was doing this very strange and creepy swaying movement. It was like it was coming closer to the door and then retreating backwards, like it was trying to decide whether to try to come in or not. It was very creepy. I had a stun gun, so I backed over to my backpack, which I had thankfully left in the lounge that night, and I dug it out. I remember hearing myself say something like, what the hell is this? out loud. The atmosphere in my house that day seemed so dark and tense. I stood there with my dog thinking, at any moment the door could open, or at any moment that shadowy figure could turn and leave. My legs were shaking. I was finding it hard to keep balance and of course my arms were shaking even more. I just tried my hardest to steady my aim 
all the while my dog was still growling at the shadow of some unknown intruder. Then suddenly, just as quick as it began, it was over. The shadow just dissipated. It was like it had disappeared in a puff of smoke. Was it ever really there? I'm pretty sure something was there. The way it disappeared was so strange it kind of just gradually seeped back into the darkness I must sound so crazy but it's true I swear that's what I saw after it left my dog calmed down and he just went right on back to the couch and laid down as if to say nothing to worry about now it was amazing I'll tell you now it took a hell of a long time to summon the courage to open that door. But when I did, I found no signs of a break-in, and my door was firmly locked. I even had put the chain on. No one had been in my house. But I definitely saw something. And I know that my dog saw it too. I think I was visited by some kind of spirit. And based on how my dog and I felt when we encountered it, I don't think that it was a particularly friendly spirit. I'm just grateful that my dog picked up on it and was there with me. It was honestly a terrifying experience. This is one I heard from a friend of a friend. I don't know if that makes it an urban legend or not, but hey, I thought I'd share it here because it's a pretty spooky one. It happened when a guy called Yamamoto went on a trip to Tohoku. He was part of a small traveling theater group and they were performing in the area. This is what happened on the first night he got there. Unfortunately, his theater group arrived during the peak tourism season so pretty much all of the chain hotels were full. However, he managed to find one room in a certain hotel, but he was told that there was only one room available. The room happened to be in an older building that was still part of the hotel. He wasn't wild on the idea of not being put in the more modern looking hotel building, but he didn't have all that many options left available. After paying for his room for the night, he was guided to it. He said that when he approached that building, he felt as if there was something wrong about it, and that made him feel a little uneasy. Well, apparently in his words, there was an air of oppression, which was hard for him to put into words. Mr. Yamamoto was a guy who apparently never had any spiritual experiences before. He was a non-believer, but he still felt a vibe that night. And if it was me in his shoes, I might have turned around and looked for another hotel. But he pressed on and went to see his room for the night. He thought that he might just be feeling a little anxious ahead of his performance or could have been a little overtired from traveling. He checked in and got himself settled and then he turned in for the night. Later that night at about 1am he woke from a dreamless sleep to some loud banging at his hotel room door. He jumped out of bed to see what was going on. He got to his feet and went to check the door. He walked over to it as quietly as he could to check if anyone was there. He called out, anyone there? After looking through the peephole and seeing that there was no one out there. Then he said he even opened the door a crack to double check, but again there was no one there. All he saw was a silent, dimly lit hallway and the green lights of the emergency exit signs glowing in one direction and some stairs and the elevator in the other. He just assumed that there was a prankster out there, banging doors and running off. He didn't mind pranks, but after 1am, that was a little much. He did however say that that weird anxious feeling he felt when he laid eyes on the building he was staying in came back at that moment. He felt cold in his new hotel room and he couldn't bring himself to sleep again. He kept looking over at the door 
and he saw the light from the hallway glowing from that little gap beneath the door. He focused on that light for a reason unknown to him, and then at some point he dropped off to sleep. He suddenly heard banging at the door again, heavy, loud bangs that brought him out of his deep sleep and back to fearful reality. He leapt out of bed again. He had to be reactive. What if it was some kind of emergency? He trembled as he approached the door, and then as he was in touching distance of the door, the banging stopped again. He instantly put his eye to the peephole to see if he could catch anyone running off down the hallway as a prank, but he didn't see a single soul out there. Just the dim glow of the neon emergency lights. He didn't want to take his eye away from the peephole just in case someone was hiding, out of sight. He really wanted to find out who had been messing with him. His left eye got tired from squinting, so he took it away to change for his right eye. As he did this, he said he felt a terrifying force coming from behind him. Before he had a chance to move or turn to face what was coming his way, he felt his head get slammed against the door, and before he knew it, he dropped down to the ground, and that's where he stayed until morning came. In the morning, he went down to the front desk immediately to complain. The man who was on the front desk who took his complaint looked a little pale as Mr. Yamamoto revealed the details of the night before when he pressed the hotel staff for an explanation. This Yamamoto guy apparently was a bit of a hothead, a guy who was quick to get escalated. I guess that comes with the territory of being in the acting game. Not sure. Anyways, he wouldn't leave the guy at the front desk alone until he reluctantly told him the following. Six years ago, there was a fire in that building. Most of the guests were able to escape through the fire exits or leave their rooms through the emergency stairs, but there was one young woman who checked into the room you stayed in that didn't make it out that night. The fire alarms were blaring in each room and the halls, but for some reason she managed to sleep through them. And when she finally realized that something was wrong, her room was black with smoke. It had seeped in through the crack beneath the door. She must have desperately crawled to the door to escape, only to find that she locked it and put the chain on from the inside before she went to bed. In the end, she passed on due to a lack of oxygen and smoke inhalation. Well, that made Mr. Yamamoto turn pale and really sent shivers coursing through his body. But it didn't scare him as much as what he realized a couple of moments later. He realized that the banging sound he had heard had been coming from inside his room. And it was likely the residual energy of that young woman's spirit trying to escape her hotel room as it filled with smoke. I used to be a middle school teacher, but I quit a few years ago. In schools, many people come and go, not just the students. With so many different types of people, interests grow stagnant. Schools can be refreshing to some, but full of malice to others. I don't know, maybe this doesn't make much sense, because it's just my opinion. But maybe it'll make a bit of sense later. Fifteen years ago, one of my students was often sick. He was born with a kidney disorder and he had been receiving regular dialysis. He was a very hard-working student, and all the others... He was a very hard-working student, and all the others looked up to him with admiration. Even when he was in pain, or when he was clearly overtired, he always had a smile on his face. He never had a bad word to say about the others. He was really good at reassuring other students when they were having rough periods, and he was full of interesting stories a natural conversationist. When he was too sick to come to class, he would make sure he studied at home. He always got great marks on his tests and his homework. He took a turn for the worse, unfortunately, and he went into hospital for a longer period. 
than usual that summer. In the late stages of autumn, we had a school festival. It was around 6 p.m. The festival was over, and everyone was already on their way home. It was already dark out. It was dark in the school as well, since we had shut off all the lights in anticipation to head home. One of my duties was to make sure that the school was empty before locking up, so I went around the building alone, making sure that everyone was gone. I didn't have a flashlight. I left it in my handbag in my car. It was really annoying. The only visible light that was available was the dim glow of the fluorescent lights and signs. The classrooms were all as black as night. They gave me the creeps. I reached my classroom and my heart nearly flew out of my chest because I saw a figure sat at a desk by the window. The figure was illuminated by the faint streetlight. It was only just visible. My eyes grew accustomed to the dark and I realized that it was the student I told you about at the start. Once I was sure it was him, I had no hesitation to walk right on into my classroom. I said, Hey, what's up? Did you forget something? You gave me a hell of a fright there. I think that's what I said. He didn't reply. Hey, come on, at least turn the lights on if you're going to be sitting in here. I said as I hit the lights. There was a strange kind of momentary pause before the lights came on. It was almost as if they glitched out for a second there. They were old, long fluorescent tube lights though. When I looked at him, I saw that he was staring right at me. Weird, but I thought I would keep on talking to him until he answered. I didn't have a whole lot of other options. I noticed that my voice was a little louder, probably due to nerves. He didn't say a word for a few minutes. Buddy, it's pitch black in here. What did you forget? Still, he remained silent. He just sat there glaring at me. I cannot tell you how uncomfortable that made me. There I was, a young female teacher alone in the classroom with a student who was sat in the dark that wouldn't say a word. I tried to take a more authoritative tone with him. Listen, it's getting late, so you better hurry up and go home. Seriously, did you forget something? I took a step towards him, and his expression changed. What are you doing here? I asked gingerly. My voice was wavering. My student didn't look like he usually did. There was something wrong with his expression. He was scaring me. His usual welcoming smile was gone. What was on his face could only be described as an evil smirk. His eyes narrowed and he drew his lips back into a thin, almost snarl. His mouth began to quiver and twitch. I could see the muscles in his mouth tightening and the blood vessels on his face redden. The fingers of the hand he had resting on the desk were gripping the wooden desk. They were turning white with the pressure he was applying. The tension was unbearable. And then he finally broke the silent standoff. I'll go now. Oh, make sure you get home safely, I replied. He didn't sound like his usual self. I left the classroom first. I felt so relieved to be leaving. It was good to hear him talk. I asked over my shoulder as I walked out. So did you leave something behind in the classroom? I wanted to keep him talking, but he didn't say a word. I was really annoyed with him now. I turned around to see an empty classroom. And in that same moment, I remembered that he had been absent from school since the summer. He was staying in a specialist hospital in a different city. There was no way he could have been in my classroom. I don't know what that thing was, but it looked like one of the sweetest students I ever had. I refused to believe that was my student. The following day, I got word from the hospital that he had passed away. A group of students and I attended his funeral. It was one of the saddest days of my life. On the first day back at school, a pair of girls from my class came up to me with indignant looks on their faces. One held a photo out to me. It was an old class trip photo. There we all were, at the top of a mountain. This photo was kept on our classroom corkboard. Beneath the blue sky, all the students posed, in whichever style they felt like. It was a funny photo, but not that day. There was something wrong with the photo that day. 
there were scratch marks over everyone's face. The scratches and stabs were so deep, they looked as if they had been created out of anger, maybe by a thumbtack or some kind of blade. Every face had been scratched out except one. His face, the boy whose funeral we attended. His face looked different than I remembered it. It was smiling that disturbing smile I saw in the dark classroom. I would love to believe that this is all some kind of misunderstanding or something illusory. I don't know if something marked him from a young age on that trip. I don't know if he harbored secret ill feelings to his classmates and me before his passing, and that hatred manifested itself in the classroom that night. But I do know, when I think back to that smile, turning into the snarl I saw in the classroom, I get the chills. This happened when I was living alone, while I was studying at university. Back then I was living in a typical two-story apartment block, which was specifically leased to students. These were single-person apartments. The building was pretty old. I remember not having the best opinion of the place when I was shown it by the realtor. It was my fault. I left the apartment hunt till the last minute, and all the good places were taken. I asked my dad to come along with me to size up the place and offer any advice. We seemed pretty satisfied that that apartment was probably the best I was going to get. So I took it. It was a corner room on the second floor which faced the road. It was tough at the start, being in a new and unusual place, living alone in the city, you know? I struggled during that first month, but when that month was over, things got a little easier. I settled in, and I started to feel more relaxed. One night I rode my bike back to my building from university. I was heading back to my apartment, down the communal hallway. As I was walking, I heard a huge bang coming from the apartment at the end of the hall. It came from the apartment opposite mine. I wondered what was happening in there, so I lingered in the hall and slowly approached the door. I heard two loud bangs. It honestly sounded like someone was throwing their entire body weight against that door. I watched as the door handle rattled with the force. I was confused and still curious, so I watched wondering what the hell was going on in there. And then I heard a voice call out from behind the door. Hey, is someone out there? This door won't open, please open it for me. It was a low and frustrated male voice. Thinking back on it, I probably should have just opened the door. I should have just helped out, but I didn't. I called out to the person behind the door. What happened? Goddamn door won't open. Is there anything you could do from out there to help me out? I looked at the door, and I couldn't see any reason why a door which opened inward would be prevented from opening on the inside. The door handle looked normal and not tampered with. If there was someone in there, I assumed that it wasn't an issue with the key. I didn't understand why they were trapped in there. Um, I can't see anything wrong with the door, to be honest with you. Well, that's bullshit, because the fucking door would open if that was the case. Ha! <laughs> open the door! The guy in there started rattling the door handle like crazy and banging on the door. He would do this while I was attempting to reply to him. You're probably thinking, why don't you just open the door? Clearly someone is struggling in there and they're getting agitated. There was one clear reason why I didn't open that door. And that was because I knew for a fact that no one lived in there. I was pretty much the last person to reserve an apartment before school started, and we were about a month and a half into our courses when this happened. I remember speaking to the realtor and even seeing the apartment. I didn't like it because I felt like I would get too much sunlight in that room. It would have been a nightmare in summer. Also another reason, I was alone in that hallway and I was a teenage woman. The guy on the other side sounded so much older than me and so much more pissed off than me. I didn't understand why I had to be the one to open the door for him either, and it seemed like it could be some kind of trap. Another final reason is because every time I passed my apartment block, 
I can see into that apartment. And there was never a light on in there, and the curtains were left open, revealing an empty apartment. There was no furniture or anything in there. It was seriously weird. While I was thinking of this, the guy behind the door was getting angrier and angrier. He was demanding me to open the door, and this definitely felt wrong. I didn't know what to do, so I just got out of there. I didn't want to go to my apartment with that going on. I spent the night in a 24-hour family restaurant. In the end, I managed to persuade my dad to help me with my finances to move out. I still wonder about that place. A thief wouldn't break into an empty room. I wonder what the guy behind the door's intentions were. I really wonder about what might have happened to me if I opened the door. I don't know if that apartment has some kind of history to it, but if it does, I don't want to know what happened there. I guess that ignorance is bliss. I'm happy with my choice. You don't always have to open the door to a stranger. This happened when I was working as a part-time cleaner in a hospital. I would clean at about midnight, as there was less patients and doctors around. It was the working hours I was given, so I couldn't really complain. One night, after all my cleaning was done, I had put my equipment away and got in the elevator and headed for the ground floor. At that time, there were no doctors, nurses, or anyone around. It was really quiet. I couldn't hear or see any of the patients. I got in the elevator and pressed the button for the ground floor, like always, except this time, despite me pressing the button for the ground floor, the elevator went down to the underground floors. I continued to press the button for the ground floor, but it was no good. The elevator finally stopped at the second basement floor. It was really weird, it had never happened before. I didn't like this floor, especially not at night time because... All that was down here was the post-mortem, examination rooms, and the morgue. Who was calling the elevator down here at this time of night, I wondered. I was the only night shift worker that night. Why would someone be messing with the elevator? Well, I got out of the elevator on this floor and I went to check to see if anyone had wandered down here. Then, behind me, I heard the jolting sound of the elevator doors closing which shocked me. The elevator started heading back up. Now I was down there alone. It was going non-stop to the highest floor in the building. I couldn't understand why, as there was nothing but a storeroom and a door which accesses the roof up there. It was off limits to the patients, and only the cleaning staff like me had any business going up there. I called the elevator back to the floor I was on. It finally arrived, and the doors opened. There was no one in the elevator, but there was something wrong. I got in, and I smelled something terrible. The elevator stank of copper. I recognized that smell, and it was the smell of blood. It was inside the elevator, yet the elevator was clean. I couldn't bear being in that elevator. I had to get out and use the stairs on the floor above. I entered the stairwell, and I was certain that someone was watching me. It felt as if someone was right behind me. I ran as fast as I could up those stairs, but I couldn't escape that feeling. I felt for sure that I wasn't alone, but every time I looked back, I realized I was the only one on those stairs. I finished my shift and felt creeped out on the long walk home, but once I was home, I felt a little better. I had work the next day and I was a little apprehensive. I saw some of my work colleagues and they were asking me if I heard the news about last night. I said I didn't know and asked what had happened. They said that someone had taken the elevator to the top floor and jumped. They said that the body was admitted to the morgue that night. Last night. It was shocking to hear that. I didn't really believe in anything paranormal, so I didn't make the connection to what happened the night before. I just got on with my work. The next day was a day off for me and I invited a friend over for a few drinks. He's a pretty strange guy to some, I guess. He claims to have the second sight, you know, 
the ability to sense the presence of the dead. I thought that he might get a kick out of my little mysterious experience, so I told him what had happened. He listened carefully, but began to fidget. I figured he just needed the toilet, so I ignored him. Then he suddenly shot to his feet, saying, I'm leaving. I asked him what the problem was. I said I had loads more booze, and I needed his help to drink it all. He couldn't be convinced to stay there. I was annoyed at him, and instead of staying up and drinking alone, I decided to go to bed. I had a terrible nightmare that night. I was being forced into this small and confined area. Cold steel metal was all around me, and it was just so horrible. The next day, I asked my friend what the problem was and why he left so abruptly. Get this, it gets really weird from here on, just letting you know. He said that while I was talking, for some reason he looked over towards my door and saw a woman peering at us through the gap in the letterbox. You know, the mail slot. Well, we all know that there is no way someone can fit their head through a mail slot, right? Well, you'd have to have a really flat or mashed up head, I guess. That thought lingered in my mind and made me feel quite sick. I didn't like looking at the mail slot after that. Could that poor person who jumped, spirit, follow me home from the morgue to my home and watch me through the mail slot? It was just too impossible to believe. I hoped that my friend was just messing with me. It wasn't a funny prank if that was the case though. Well, I ended up moving away shortly after to get a better job and things got better after that. It's a weird little tale I wanted to share. Thanks for listening. The other night I was heading home and I saw a woman who looked a little worse for wear like she had too many on board. She was getting harassed by some guy, so I went over to see if she was alright and to help her out. To cut a long story short, she grabbed my shirt as she was falling, and I think she gripped the pocket of my shirt or something because it ripped and tore a seam in the shirt. I was really annoyed and upset to be honest. It was my favourite shirt. It was the last birthday present I ever got from my wife before she passed away. It genuinely upset me. But I guess there are worse ways to ruin a shirt. At least I was trying to help someone, and I didn't spill something on it, or rip it through my own clumsiness. Still, it was a shame, but it couldn't be helped. I decided to hang on to the shirt, or maybe I should say I couldn't bring myself to throw it away. I figured I could still use it as long as I didn't wear it outside of the house. I washed the shirt, and I hung it up in the wardrobe. That night I had a dream. It was the first dream I had had in a very long time. I dreamt that I came home just as I did last night. But the only difference was I didn't come home to an empty home. I walked through the door and I saw my wife stood in the hallway. She was looking right at me. She looked at my shirt and tutted and said, What's that? She told me to give it to her. I took it off and she instantly went to work on it at the dining room table with a needle and a thread. I went upstairs to go change into another shirt and I came back down and sat on the sofa. I was looking over at her as she was working on sewing up my shirt and that's all I remember. It was a nice dream. The next day I had plans with my daughter to go to the cinema and watch a movie and catch up. She's been living alone for a while. I was wondering what to wear. I opened my wardrobe as usual, and I noticed my favorite shirt. I took a look at it again, to see how bad the rip was, and to my surprise, I couldn't find it. I turned it over and over again in my hands, and I still couldn't find any tear in the fabric. I couldn't believe it. I looked at the back of the shirt, and I noticed something. It was sewn up from the back so that the rip wasn't visible at the front. I wondered how the hell was this possible? And then I remembered my dream from last night. And I thought to myself, no way, she stitched it up for me. 
I didn't know how to comprehend the situation. It was so strange. I guess I knew what I was supposed to be wearing that day, so I took the shirt out of the wardrobe and threw it on. I told my daughter about my dream and the shirt. She looked up at me and said, Oh, Dad, knowing you, you were probably drunk and imagined it. I bet there was no rip in the shirt. As she said this, I could see the tears welling in her eyes. I knew what she truly believed about my dream, even if she couldn't bring herself to say it out loud. I was amazed. That's really the only word for it. I mean, I got to see my wife again, and my shirt was fixed. I'm still kind of speechless. That's just like her, you know? Always helping me out in situations like that. I'm hoping that this could be a regular thing, because I tell you what, I'd love to come home one day and have some of her cooking waiting for me again. Or I'd love to even see it in the fridge. It might not happen that way, I guess, but hey, here's to hoping. This is an experience I had when I stayed with my family, in a guest house, way out in the mountains. My daughter was quite young when this happened. I think she was about four. My husband and I had thought that we had put her down for the night, and she was sleeping soundly. But we were wrong. We were in the living room area of this guest house, and I guess it was just after midnight. Our daughter came rushing out of her bedroom over to us. What's wrong? Do you need to use the bathroom? I asked. She shook her head. I remember that she looked a little shaken up. It was a rare look for a girl her age. She then said, No, Mum. The lady outside said, Can you let me in, but I can't reach the lock on the window. Can you do it for me? I sat there staring at her, completely unable to understand what she had just said. We were literally in the middle of nowhere. We had drove miles and miles to get to this log cabin, and there wasn't another residence anywhere nearby. I didn't know how to approach the topic with my daughter. I didn't want to call her a liar for having a bad dream, so before my husband could open his mouth, I simply asked, Who said that to you? As soon as those words left my mouth, Concern inside me like a flower bloomed. My question to my daughter boomed repeatedly in my head. Who said that to you? My daughter seemed to sense my distress, and I will be honest with you. I don't think I hid my concern very well. I must have looked racked with emotion. The lady with the hurt head outside the window. She's been banging and banging on the glass, ma'am. I shot a glance over to my husband, and we jumped to our feet and marched straight into the room that my daughter was sleeping in. I went to turn on the lights, but my husband stopped me. He said that if there was someone outside, then we would be able to see them on the outside if the light was off, and they wouldn't be able to see us as easily. I saw something against the window. I know I saw something. There was this white shadow. It was kind of like a mist or some kind of smoke. It looked like the rough outline of a person, and then it was gone. It dissipated. My husband asked us to wait inside with the door locked while he went outside to check on the situation. My daughter then said, The lady was sad, Mum. She looked hurt too. And she looked like she had horns sometimes. I was frightened, really frightened at the idea that there might be someone out there trying to persuade my child to let them in, and equally frightened that I might have just had an encounter with the supernatural. My husband eventually returned from checking outside. I say eventually, it must have been a matter of a couple of minutes, but it felt like an eternity. I didn't see anyone out there, no footprints either. I mean, there's gravel around the whole building, surely we would have heard someone run off. I didn't even hear a thing out there. I went by the door while he was stood there. I held my daughter's hand tightly as I approached. The door was open, and my husband went to close it, but I stopped him. I wanted to take one good look out there. All that I could see was a dark sea of trees. 
The tree line was about 20 foot from the cabin, and all I could think of was, what could that tree line be hiding? The bugs chirped, and the wind blew, and it was at that point that I shut the door. If someone needed to help, like my daughter said, that the woman at the window asked for, then surely you would come back while the door was wide open, right? We all slept in the same bed that night, and thankfully nothing else suspicious happened after that. I will say that I was completely on edge until we left that cabin. It's the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I always wonder who that hurt slashed horned lady was and why she wanted my daughter to let her in. This happened when I was a university student living alone in Tokyo. I wasn't living a life of luxury. My apartment was pretty damn small, but I did like it. And it was the corner apartment of the top floor, so it let in plenty of light. I picked this apartment because the rent was considerably cheaper than any other apartment in that building. I knew why it was cheap. It was an accident property. A home with a history. I didn't care, though. I'm the type of person who doesn't really believe in the paranormal. I trust in science and logic. So I had no hesitation when signing the contract. As soon as I moved in, odd things began to happen. It started with the kettle. It would just flick on by itself and the water would start boiling. It was pretty jarring to hear that late at night. Let me tell you, a couple of times I woke up due to the noise it made. I used to leave the kettle unplugged after use but I didn't always remember to unplug it. The kettle would never flip on if the lights was on though. It only did it when it was dark. I have to admit, it was pretty scary, but I kind of grew to live with it. I woke up one night unable to move anything but my eyes. It was a completely new sensation for me. I didn't know at the time, but it was sleep paralysis. I was surprisingly calm. Maybe that was because I didn't know what was going on. I just moved my eyes around the room. I had a floor chair and a kotatsu in the middle of the room. It's a little table you just put your legs under to keep warm when sitting on the floor. Some have electric heaters. Anyway, I looked towards that area and I saw the strangest thing I've ever seen. It looked like there were people sat in my chairs. But they didn't look like real people. They were like stick men. What I mean by that is they had outlines, white outlines but they were in the shape of people. Very strange. When I saw it, I laughed inside. I just couldn't move my mouth. I didn't understand what was going on. It was all so weird. Then the next thing I knew, I was asleep. I guess I must have fallen asleep as I woke up and I saw the morning light filtering in through the curtains. I could freely move my arms and legs, so I just got up and got on with my day. It was around that time that I landed a part-time job working in an izakaya, which is a restaurant slash bar here. I had no complaints working late at night because of the weird goings on at home. I was more than happy to pick up a night shift, plus I was making some good money. Anyways, one night I came home from work and I noticed something. There were shoe prints on my door. It looked as if someone had tried kicking it in or something. I was there mumbling and complaining to myself as I opened my door. I turned around to see the reverse side of the door to check the damage, and when I did that, I saw the same kind of shoe print marks on the inside of the door. Those marks definitely were not there when I left for work. I got all my shoes out and I checked the shoe prints against what was in my room. I didn't own any kind of shoe like that. I didn't give anyone a key and I always locked my door. It was really weird and getting scarier by each passing day and night. I was getting really freaked out. I mean, I was about 20 years old, a female living alone for the first time in my life. I got so worried that I called my parents and told them what was happening. To be honest, I was beginning to think about moving at that stage. 
You can imagine my parents' shock when they heard about the footprints. They wanted me to get out of there straight away. And I agreed, to be honest. I began the search for a new place. I found somewhere new. It was a bit more expensive, but Mum and Dad offered to help me out a little, so it worked. When I was packing up my things, I heard something get delivered into my mailbox. It was just a simple letterbox with a cage. I heard what sounded like a huge wad of envelopes get shoved through it. None of the mail was addressed to me. It was all addressed to some woman. Her name sounded old, like she wasn't another student. Like she wasn't another student. It would be like getting mail addressed to a Dorothy or something nowadays. Apparently, she lived in that room years ago. I didn't get any mail from anyone but the mail that was meant for me whilst I was living there. I don't know why the hell that turned up all of a sudden. I kind of wish I opened some of it now just so I could tell you what was in it. It was a bit freaky though. I didn't want to touch it. I moved away after that. I just had to. I'm sorry if this story barely makes any sense or is different to the usual kinds of ones that are shared. I didn't really have a haunting per se. I just had a series of very strange but very true events. So I guess my message to anyone is, be careful of homes with a history and be wary of a cheap price. I work for a construction site, and something strange happened during a demolition. I have been on some pretty dangerous jobs, and some downright crap jobs. I could share a few experiences, but nothing tops this one. I was sent out to demolish an old house in a suburban neighborhood. It seems as if the house was some kind of company dormitory or something. Based on this, the tenants would change every year or so. It was a pretty small place, one kitchen, two bedrooms, and a bathroom and a lounge. It seems as if there was a basement there at one point too. It was a renovated property. I didn't expect the job to take a whole lot of time. The furniture was already moved out ahead of my arrival. On first inspection, the job looked a little easier than described. Also, the pay for the work required seemed too high, but who was I to complain? There were some rules though. The interior must be stripped including all the flooring before working on the exterior. I was told that someone would turn up during the demolition, and I was to give them free reign over the house, and I was told not to bother them with small talk or questions. Finally, I was asked not to reveal to anyone whatever happened during the demolition. During my work, a man showed up with someone from our company. He looked to be in his thirties. He was thin and fair-skinned. He didn't look like someone who worked in the construction industry. He showed up in a station wagon and he was carrying an overnight bag. He appeared to refuse a helmet. Weird. So we started work. Some of my team started taking up the flooring and dismantling the underflooring and stacking it outside. We were doing as the instructions stated. The man in his thirties quietly watched from the entrance as not to get in the way. We changed rooms. When we changed rooms, he opened his overnight bag and removed some objects. He took out a face mask, a bottle of cloudy white looking liquid, and some unusual tool I hadn't ever seen before. It had a handle in the middle, and it had two pointed ends which appeared to be made of gold. I was about to use the crowbar to remove the flooring in the next room. The floorboards were much thicker in that room, but the room seemed the newest. I was working one of the corners, and a younger employee of our company was working one of the other corners. My concentration was broken by his shouting, What the hell is all this? The man came rushing over from the doorway, and quickly bent down by the side of him. Beneath the floorboards, the young worker had found a skull. The skull appeared to belong to an animal, not a person. He carefully used the shovel to dig around it an attempt to remove it, but to all our surprise, he found a full skeleton down there. The lengths 
of some of the bones must have been up to a meter long. We were thinking that someone must have buried a dog there, but we couldn't be sure. The bones seemed to belong to some kind of animal I couldn't even imagine. We didn't really get a good look at them, since we were told to get them removed pretty quickly by the man without the helmet. All the bones were scooped up and put into a black bag and then taken away. It was pretty weird, but we kept on working. I was looking forward to getting paid. Once the bones in the flooring were removed, the man came over to us and said he had a couple more requests for us. There should be a small incense burner in the ceiling above where the bones were found. I want that to be disposed of too. I'm going to get some charcoal from the car. And when I come back with it, I want you to bury the bones, the incense burner, and the charcoal. They should be buried where the demolition has been concluded. At the demolition site. On leveled ground. Okay? He said it to us so businesslike. Like, it wasn't weird at all. But it clearly was. Anyway, we did as he asked, since he was paying. I found the incense burner in the spot he said it would be in. I thought that it looked pretty expensive. It could have been an antique. I thought about taking it for myself and just telling him I buried it. But then something in my mind persuaded me not to. Something had been going on here and I didn't want to be part of it. After I clocked off, we removed all the wooden metal from the attic and then the heavy machinery was brought in to level the hollowed out house. Before we got to demolish it, the man went back in with his overnight bag, waving around that weird golden tool and squirting that liquid. We buried the stuff we were told to bury, and then we went on our way. This isn't where it ends, though. There are two follow-up little additions which might be of interest. After work was concluded, I couldn't stop thinking about how weird it was, and I was obsessed with finding out more information about that house. I looked online through many news articles and forums. I probably shouldn't have done that, but my curiosity got the best of me. So it turns out that the house was used as a company dorm for employees of a very big household name company. I cannot share that name with you. I'd really like to, but I can't. I don't think it's a good idea. Anyways, it was a company dorm, but the weird thing was they had another company dorm on the other side of town. A much more modern one in a much more convenient location. I found out that the people who lived in the weird house I worked on were always young employees with new families. Rumor has it that within two to three years of living in that house, some kind of terrible incident happened to them. Someone in their family passed away, for example. It wasn't ever by accident, suicide or illness. It was by something else. It was like they suddenly ceased to exist. They just dropped down dead. There was also an incident where a small child was rumored to be killed by a truck. It made me think of all those bones, and although I'm pretty sure they weren't human, I'm not 100% sure. So that freaked me out. The other incident happened about three years ago. I went to a conservative candidate selection, and I happened to meet someone from that very demolition job. The man who didn't wear a helmet. It seemed as if he was working for the conservative candidate as his secretary or something. He looked a little shocked to see me, but then he smiled and we spoke with one another and it went a little bit like this. Oh, thanks for your help. I'm glad to see that you're in great health. That's a relief. Uh, you did get rid of the things I told you to get rid of, right? Especially that incense burner. Yep. Good, yep, thanks. Strange job, but it needed to be done, it really did. It's important to do the work honestly, right? No cutting corners. So I'm glad you did what I requested. If you had done it wrong then, <laughs> hey, who knows? We might not be here today, especially me. He seemed to be a little frightened by something, and he was clearly deliberately choosing his words as if he was being listened in on. Call me paranoid, but that's how it felt. And then, without skipping a beat, it was as if all the emotion ran out of his face. He turned to me, dead-eyed, and said, By the way, thanks for your vote. 
I'll never forget that look. I think that there are areas in the world we shouldn't know about. Stuff is going on behind the scenes. I lived in an apartment which was built in 1989. Let me just go over the layout of the apartment because it's important. It's a pretty standard place, but it has a loft. It's not that big to be honest, it's a little cramped in there. I don't really like my loft. I find it kind of, I don't know, creepy. There's a certain sense of vulnerability that comes with having a loft. I can't quite explain it, but by the end of this story, you'll know why they frightened me. It all started with a feeling one night after work. I haven't been able to shift this feeling. As soon as I come through the door, the first thing I see as I enter my apartment is my loft. I get the feeling that sometimes something is watching me from up there. At first, I just thought that it was my tired mind conjuring up something. I've been tired before, you know. This felt different. Little did I know a grudge was born that day. Let me give you a POV. When you're in the bed in the loft, if you naturally look out or down, you'd see the entryway leading to the kitchen. Now naturally, when I sleep, I sleep on my side, and therefore I face the entryway to the kitchen. Sometimes before sleep comes for me, I get the strong feeling that someone is looking up at me, staring at me from down there in the entryway. In uneasy times like that, I try to read or get myself to sleep as soon as possible. I hit the lights so I don't get distracted. I just use a little nightlight near my pillow to read my book. However, one night a deeper sense of unease crept over me. I felt as if something was wrong. I heard a noise coming from down below. The lights were off down there. I listened carefully. It sounded as if someone was exhaling. It definitely sounded like breathing. The second my mind understood that I was hearing breathing, I stayed deathly still. I was horrified. My heart began to thunder in my chest. I thought that there was an intruder in my home. The air in the room felt heavy and oppressive. It enveloped me. It was all around me. The room seemed to grow darker. I felt strange. I could still hear that noise. It resounded around the room below. It sounded closer. Beneath the loft there was a blind spot. I felt as if I pinpointed the spot where that breathing sound was coming from. Someone was down there, with their back against the wall. I managed to convince myself of that. When I imagined that, I shuddered. I drew my shoulders up to my chin and I held my covers tight. It was like a stalemate. I couldn't do anything and the feeling that there was someone down there wouldn't go away. After a moment or two, the breathing sound suddenly stopped. I thought that it was all over, that I imagined the whole thing and relief washed over me. Then in that moment, I heard a familiar sound, a sound that I had heard many times before. It was the instantly recognizable sound of someone climbing the ladder which leads to the loft. It sounded exactly like someone climbing up towards me on that ladder. I was frozen with fear, again, I was unable to move. My mind was a mess of fear and worry as I heard the sound of someone climbing up. Clarity came to me though swiftly. I guess this is what they call fight or flight. I made my mind up to deal with whoever was coming up. The sound continued. I was certain that I would see someone's head emerge in a matter of seconds. Those seconds came and went, although they felt as if they were hours. The tension was unbearable. Nothing came into view, and then the sound stopped. It stopped at the top of the ladder. If someone was on that ladder, I should have seen them. It sounded like whatever came up that ladder was now in the loft with me. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was sure that there was an intruder in the house. And as soon as that thought crossed my mind, my nightlight went out and I was plunged into absolute darkness. Then, close to my ear, I heard three words 
which chilled me to the core. Who are you? I cannot remember much after that point. I guess I fainted or something. It was morning when I opened my eyes again. I don't know why, but I don't really feel the need to pursue or search for the meaning or an explanation to this experience. I'm debating whether or not to move out. I feel like it could be just the beginning of something. There's definitely something bad in my apartment. I don't think I'll be able to stand it if something like that happens again. I love going on off-road solo biking trips. I usually go during national holidays. During this year's Obon holiday, I decided to take a four day and three night trip to the southernmost tip of Kyushu. It's boring if you take the national highways on such a journey, so I always like taking the back roads. It's way more scenic that way. I love the entwining roads and the views of the coast and the thick forests. So when I took off the first day to begin my trip, the pedal was down and my speed was high. The engines seemed to be running fine too. I was in good spirits. I crashed before, and I'm reminded of that crash whenever I reach 100 kilometers per hour, or just over 60 miles per hour, because my front wheel starts to shake a little. That night, I stayed with a friend. Had a great night, but I was up early the next day. The second day was good, very scenic. I stopped by a hot spring on the way, took a bunch of photos. I was making detours on the way. It was great, but I was off schedule. I wasn't anywhere near where I was supposed to be according to my plan. I was thinking maybe I should speed things up a little, to account for the time I lost. Maybe get on the highway or something. Find the most direct route. On the other hand, there was a lush stretch of forest roads upcoming. I was looking forward to this road. It was always amazing to ride that road. It's between Kumamoto and Miyazaki if anyone's interested. I didn't have a hotel booked, so I didn't feel as if I needed to rush, so I decided to enjoy the forest road. It was a beautiful winding road, with clear views of the mountains either side. It's really satisfying, there's a river running by the road at points, so you get the cool air as you go over the bridges. I saw a small shrine up ahead, and there was a road leading up towards the mountains. I was intrigued, there was light still left in the day, and I didn't have to be anywhere in a hurry, so I thought, screw it, let's see what's up that road. No one was around anyway. I was on my way. I was taking corners on my bike with one leg lowered into the curve. It was an amazing feeling to be out there on these roads alone. There were no guardrails, so if you fell off this high up the mountain, there would be a hell of a long way down. There were trees though. A morbid thought popped into my mind. I saw myself pinballing between the trees, down and down. I was seemingly lost in my thoughts because before I knew it, the front tire started shaking. I was going way faster than I needed to. Too fast into the approaching corner, I felt the bike's rear tire slip beneath me. I knew what was coming. I turned into the skid, but I was going way too fast. I tried to hang on, but it was too late. The next thing I knew, I was sailing through the air, watching my motorbike slide below me. I was thrown violently back down to earth, and I hit the ground really hard. The only thing I can take some solace in is the fact that I didn't collide with a tree, a boulder, or even, God forbid, go over the edge. It really, really hurt though. I got up very slowly. I thought I might have broken some bones, so I was being very cautious. Luckily, I didn't break a bone in my body. Still not sure how I did that. I slowly staggered towards my bike. It had slid a good hundred meters ahead where I had landed. The blinkers and the side mirrors were toast. Multiple parts were going to need replacing. I set the bike upright and I tried to start the engine, but there was nothing. There was just the silence of the mountains. It looked like the front fork was twisted and it might be pinching the tire. Not a good sign. Darkness was descending and I was out of reception on my cell phone. I didn't have much choice. It was time to start walking. I dragged my bike to the side of the road and tried my best to conceal it there. I hooked my jacket over the handlebars just in case it rained 
and I headed back down the road I came from. I brought my rucksack with me, and I had the flashlight function on my phone. I walked for about three hours, and I thought during that time I would have reached the shrine I saw earlier, but I didn't. I don't know how this was possible. I went uphill, therefore I must come back downhill. There was a mountain on the right, and a slope on the left. A mirror image of the route up. I guess that I must have taken a turn or slipped down a side road because things weren't adding up to me. I had a map in my bag, but it wasn't much use if I didn't know where the hell I was. And it was getting dark. The moon had hidden its face behind the clouds. I saw no city lights. If it wasn't for the flashlight on my phone, I'm sure I would have walked right off of the edge of the mountain. I decided it was time to take a rest. I was relying on adrenaline energy from the crash, but there was a limit. I stopped by the side of the road and lit a smoke. Once I was still, I heard the sound of flowing water, so I guessed that the river I passed must not be too far away. I looked for the shrine, but I couldn't find it. I must have taken the wrong route. It couldn't be helped. I would be sleeping rough that night. I couldn't be bothered to walk anymore. I decided I would make a plan to when I woke up. I just needed to find a decent place off the road so that I wouldn't be killed or woken up regularly by any passing traffic. I found nothing in my vicinity so I kept walking and after the road opened up a little more. I couldn't believe my luck. I literally stumbled across some kind of village. I looked around and I couldn't see a single light on in the village. It was clearly abandoned. The buildings were half destroyed, they were too old. Most of them were made of wood. I saw a tall, rusty, and very old water tower. No one had lived here for years, I thought to myself as I passed it by. It was a pretty small village, perhaps settlement would be a more accurate description. There were only about five or six houses lined up. The walls were covered in ivy and other areas. The walls had collapsed. You could see inside if you wanted to. I wanted to be inside a building, so I tried to open the doors, but I noticed that the doors outside were locked. There were stone steps running through the village like stepping stones. I saw a well, too. It was covered by thick wooden boards. I took a few photos of the village for memory's sake. I leaned against the door of some empty-looking house, and I wiped my face with a towel, and then I applied some insect repellent in preparation for sleeping outdoors. I laid down on the porch, grateful for the flat ground and completely ready for sleep. Drowsiness quickly settled in. I woke up after a short while. I immediately had the feeling that something was wrong. I felt like I was suddenly not alone anymore. Then I heard a noise. It sounded like the scuffing of shoes, someone dragging their feet as they walked, and it was coming from inside the house. I had to make sure I wasn't hearing things. The, the sound was faint, but steady. It had a strange, slow rhythm to it. The door had frosted glass, plus it was dark, so I couldn't see anything through the window. Was someone there? The place looked truly abandoned. I didn't think anyone had lived there for years. I had to make sure, though. I put my ear against the door. There were noises coming from inside the house. There were people walking around in there. The moon had come out from behind the clouds and the abandoned village became more and more visible. I would be lying if I said that I didn't start to get scared. I felt for sure that there would be no good reason for there to be people out here this late at night. My heart rate was increasing. I felt it in my chest. I sensed a presence by my side. Some unknown sense of horror gripped me. Something was right next to me, something I couldn't see. Then I heard a strange sound coming from the distance, like an object had been thrown. I looked in that direction, and I saw nothing. I couldn't move. I didn't want to take a single step just in case it would be the catalyst. I guess I was bound by something, like some kind of waking sleep paralysis. I could move my eyes, but that was about it. I looked up to the window of the house I was stood in front of to see a black shadowy figure passing by the window. I kept watching, and the shadows seemed to be going back and forth. 
Is that the sound I heard? The sound of someone pacing back and forth? I looked to a window. I guess that might be the kitchen window. And I saw the same kind of shadows going back and forth in there. The fear inside of me was unbearable. My body felt as if it was made of stone. I was completely helpless. I couldn't move. I don't know if that was a good or bad thing because if I did move in those moments, then I'm sure that whatever was in that house would have noticed it. I don't know what would have happened then. I heard a noise and I looked in its direction. My eyes were well adjusted to the dark now. I pinpointed the source of the noise. The well I had walked past before, its wooden cover was now laying on the ground. I swear I saw a figure of a person, maybe a woman, glaring at me from the well. Her eyes and the top of her head was all I could make out, but I felt for sure that something was watching me. I didn't know how the hell any of this could be happening. It was horrible. It was just all so terrifying. I looked back towards the house and I saw a pale face from the frosted window peering at me. It was brief, but I know it was there. The footstep sounds had stopped and it was just me the abandoned village, and something else. Something that watched. It was at this point that I screamed. My body was finally back under my control. I grabbed my helmet, and I headed back towards the road I'd come from. I didn't need to use a flashlight since the moon was suddenly so full and bright. I stumbled my way back through the forest and away from that village. My body hurt, but I forced myself to keep walking until the sun came out. I couldn't bear to be alone in the dark. I made it to a nearby town, and from there I got a bus and then a train back to my place. The bike was scrapped. I didn't abandon it. I got that squared away. I got it picked up. It's a shame. It was a good bike. My body stayed bruised for a good few weeks. I swear that whole trip was cursed. But on that trip I managed to convince myself of the existence of the paranormal. I don't know if what I witnessed was a spirit or a ghost or... What? But it was enough for me to know that we aren't alone here. I checked the photos that I took that night, and I couldn't find anything like orbs in them. There was one thing, though. There was a whole host of graves in the background of one of the shots. I wonder what happened in that village to make it abandoned. There's something about that well, and the house. That nervous pacing of feet. I can't forget that sound. When I was younger, the elementary school that I went to had a kind of mystery that all these kids were wrapped up in. There was a room at school with an unopenable door. I don't know when or how it started, but all the kids said that there was this one door that no one ever opened and seemed to be eternally locked. That was until one day, when one kid from school, who was asked to return some supplies in our after-school club, to the stationary cupboard, noticed that the door was open. He wasn't that interested in it, as he had been told by our teachers to not go into that room, and that it was off limits. He was in the same class as me, by the way. He told me once that the door gave him a bad feeling. I didn't really get that from the door myself at the time. We were all staying late after class. I cannot remember why. Probably some after-school activity. When he came back to our class, he told me and another classmate that the door was open. We were both interested in finding out what might be behind the door, so my classmate, perhaps driven by curiosity, piped up and said, I'll go take a look. He got to his feet to go check it out. I went with him, but I didn't want to go into that room. I wasn't profoundly scared of whatever was inside it. I was more scared of getting in I was more scared of getting a detention or something, so I waited outside. I realized that I had been waiting for a while for him to come back. I started to get nervous. All the other kids were leaving and even some of the teachers looked like they were getting ready to go too. 
I nervously paced the corridor, but no matter how long I waited for him, he never came out of that room. It just didn't make any sense to me. I didn't want to go in before, and I definitely didn't want to go in... then. But I got worried, and I approached the door to see if I could make out where he went. Just as I was about to crane my head around the door frame, a teacher came along. I told the teacher what happened, and she looked shocked. She made an attempt to look in there, and then she muttered something like, Should have locked this door. That was when I realized, for a brief while, that the rumor was just a rumor, and it was just a door. Just a door that they locked. I felt a bit dumb for believing that some door at school had some kind of power, the teacher went inside very briefly and then came out and said something outrageous. There's no one in there. That just didn't seem possible to me. I watched my classmate go in there and not come out. And therefore he just had to be in there. Logic dictated that to me back then and it still does now. He went in and he did not come out. I asked the teacher if she was sure and she said to me in a very cold tone, there is no one in that room. She went ahead and shut the door as she said it. I went home because everyone else was leaving. I didn't know what else to do. I was a kid. I couldn't stay there all night. I told my mum about what happened. And she must have seen how worked up I was. Because she called the school in the hope that a teacher or a janitor might be there still. She came into my bedroom after she got off the phone with someone beaming this big smile and said to me, your little class friend went home in the end. One of your teachers told me so. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. No, he didn't go home. I was waiting for him. He went in that room and he didn't come out. By the way, this wasn't some room that was massive or was on the ground floor or anything like that. This was a room on the third floor. Had he jumped out of a window, he wouldn't have made it home in one piece. I can't believe that the teacher didn't even bother to go in and do a proper sweep of the room either, come to think of it. And now they were telling me that he just went home? I wasn't buying it. My mum laughed at my frustration and then said, I must have just misunderstood the situation. No mum, I didn't misunderstand. I was being lied to. I knew that then and I know that now. I couldn't wait for school the next day. I had so many questions. And if I'm being honest, some small part of me did believe that there was a tiny chance that my classmate ended up going home somehow. Hell, perhaps he hid in that room to avoid the teachers for a prank, I don't know. Like I said though, a very, very small part of me held out hope for that. When I got to school, I looked over at the desk he would have occupied and it was empty. I hoped against my better judgment that he might just be running late, but I was once again wrong. I was told before the end of the day that he moved away by my regular teacher. His dad apparently got transferred at work and it had been planned for a long time. I never saw that door he went through open again after that, and I still get very anxious about what happened. I mean, did he really move? It's possible, sure, but why was everything so sudden? And why was all the news coming out of our teachers and none of it out of him? It didn't make any sense to me. It's been so long that I can't remember his name, and I kind of can't trust my memory. It just seems kind of hazy. A lot of weird stuff went on in my hometown. There was always a big military and police presence. I don't know if that means anything, but as an adult I realized that my town was pretty unique. I just wonder if he saw something that he wasn't supposed to. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous with it being a school and all, but the phrase hiding in plain sight makes me think otherwise sometimes. I really want to know if that kid ended up being alright. I really hope that's the case. I think about this often. I'd go back to our school, but it isn't there anymore. I bought a house in the suburbs a few years ago, and since I lived pretty close to the train station, I decided that I would use the train to commute to work. This was about five years ago, I guess. I had just had my son. These days I drive, and I have to put up with traffic, but there's a very good reason why I drive now, and I'll tell you. 
On the night this happened, I had been out with some co-workers after work. This kind of thing was standard in our company. We would usually get together, have a drink, like once a month. It was a late night. I knew it was going to be a late one. It always was. I wanted to make it home before the last train. My wife was at home with my son, and I didn't want her to be up late worrying about me. I think I caught the second or third from last train of the night back home. When I got on the train, I noticed it was almost empty, and that was really great. I had enough space to relax. I got a little too relaxed, and I fell asleep, actually. I was pretty low on sleep. It was about a 50-minute train ride home, so I thought I might as well catch up on some lost sleep. But I didn't need to change trains either. I woke up, now and then, to see people exiting the train. In the daytime, you could see these huge high-rise apartment blocks from the train windows, so I guess these people were commuters like me. I knew from the station that I was in that I wouldn't be home for another 20 minutes or so, so I decided against shutting my eyes again. In order not to fall asleep, I stood up and faced the window. I figured that looking at something was probably better than being comfortable in my seat. I wanted the distraction. I watched shapes of buildings pass by under the cover of darkness. I tried to imagine where I was based on the shapes of those buildings. At the next stop, the last couple of people got off, leaving me completely alone. It was kind of unusual to be alone in a train at night. If you've ever seen the trains in Tokyo, you'll understand. They are always super crowded. I enjoyed the rarity of my situation. I was thinking strange things. The buzz I had from the beers earlier was wearing off and tiredness was in full effect. There might have been others on the train, but I'm specifically talking about my carriage. The most popular carriages were at the front because they were closest to the stairs when you got off. I always took about the third or second carriage when I rode the train, but anyway, that's not really important. I was about one station away from home. Between the next station and the station I get off at, there's a tunnel. This tunnel runs right through a mountain and plunges the train into darkness for about three minutes or so. When the train went into that tunnel, I used the opportunity to look at myself in the window. Due to the darkness, it acted like a kind of mirror, and I used that mirror to adjust my hair and try to make myself look more presentable for when I would go home and face my wife. What the hell? I heard myself mutter. Reflected in the dark window was a man sat opposite me. He was an old man who looked to be in his fifties. He looked like a hiker. I thought that I was completely alone in that carriage, so I freaked out for a moment. But due to how tired or buzzed I was, did I completely miss this guy? I asked myself. I decided that I did, and I told myself not to worry too much about it. I made a mental note to check my surroundings more thoroughly next time. I tried not to stare as well, I felt as if I couldn't help it though. The guy was staring into the window directly at me. He did not grin. He did not look away. He was fixated on me. The look that he was giving me wasn't a friendly one. I would describe it as expressionless. It was chilling. I didn't like it. I didn't want to turn around and face him. I decided not to be confrontational for the sake of my wife and my newborn. I would take out my phone and ignore that weirdo stare. As I pulled my phone out of my pocket, I managed to pull my house keys out with it. They fell to the floor. I stooped to pick up the keys, and the next couple of things happened in what felt like a split second. I looked into the window to keep an eye on this guy as I bent down to get the keys. He shot to his feet and emerged about 30 or 50 centimeters behind me. He was holding something in his hand and raising it above his head. It was a small axe like a handy mountaineering ice pick axe kind of thing. I screamed. I was completely defenseless. I just kind of dived forward, keeping low towards the door to the next carriage. I had a plan in mind to get as close to the driver as possible. As I put my hand on the door that connects to the next carriage, I took the opportunity to look again to see what was happening behind me. It was instinctive. I imagined to see that guy racing right up behind me. But I couldn't see him anymore. He wasn't there. I don't know if he dropped down low to hide or attack in a different manner, or if he was ever there. But I couldn't see him anymore, and that terrified me. I ran right to the front of the train and waited 
a few terrifying moments, no more than 30 seconds in all actuality, for the train came to a stop at my station. The train pulled in and I shot off of it. A young couple and an office worker stared right at me as they boarded. I was in a complete state. I wanted to run for it, but as I turned to go, I thought about those people who would be getting on the train. Was that man I saw in the reflection of the glass still on board? I made some garbled plea with them not to get on the train, but they ignored me. The train started moving down the tracks and I walked and then ran to keep pace with it. I wanted to catch the attention of those people who boarded. I made some gestures with my arms while shouting at them. I told them not to go into the next carriage as best as I could given the circumstances. I told the station staff, and they threatened to call the police if I didn't stop making a scene. I had just had a close call. I couldn't calm down, I'll have to admit that. But I felt as if they needed to know. I just hoped that somebody listened. I hoped that whatever I saw was nothing more than the conjuration of a tired mind as well. But something in me doesn't believe that though. I think that was real. I never commuted to work again. I will never ride through that tunnel again. There are some expenses and inconveniences worth suffering, I guess.